Let's now look at the electromagnetic spectrum. And we're going to see what these different words right here mean. But first I want to talk about what this really means here. We're talking about light. Now light can be seen as a particle or a wave. And like I said before, this is something to do with quantum mechanics of what is it. But in this case, we're going to consider it as a wave. And we're going to consider it really as an electromagnetic wave. And the reason that is, we looked at this before, that's because um, it has an oscillating electric field and a magnetic field. Um, now it's a type of transverse wave, which means the direction that the electric field oscillates is perpendicular to the direction that it travels. So for example, maybe the electric field goes up and down, and that means then that the uh, wave might travel to the right, for example. So that could be light. This is the direction of travel. Maybe this is the direction of oscillation of its electric field, or it could be the magnetic field as well. So this is how light works, and because, or at least how light can be described. And because light is an electromagnetic wave, that means, um, so I'll say maybe so that, we can describe it as a wave. So we can use some of these uh, definitions from waves to talk about it here. So we can describe it um, as a wave, which means we have things like wavelength is going to be something that we can talk about and frequency and speed in fact that's what we're going to use here we can use this equation remember v equals f lambda that's our wave equation remember that lambda is your wavelength which is measured in meters. So if I did a diagram or a drawing of your wave, if this is, um, this right here could be, for example, displacement. So this right here is something that's measured in meters versus position, which is also in meters. If I saw this sort of uh, wave doing, I don't know, something like this, like that, if that's the light, then this distance from here to here for example, that right there is called the wavelength. That right there would be. Of course, we have the amplitude. And in a similar way, if we then defined it like this right here, but this time we had the time, in seconds, and this was still position in meters. And then we can do some other sort of graph. Maybe it does you know, a similar thing, but maybe, you know, maybe not so many. Um, this one right here, for example, this distance from here to here, remember this is units of time, so that means this right here is its period. And the period is written as t. So don't forget these important equations that we have the frequency, which is f, and the frequency is measured in hertz, or 1 over seconds. And we of course have v, which is the speed, which is in meters per second. Don't forget this equation here that relates the frequency and the period. So the frequency is 1 over the period. So I'm just reminding you of these equations that we've looked at. Now if it's light, we know that light doesn't just go any speed. If we're talking about a vacuum at least, so if we're in a vacuum or even in air, we can say that light, for light we can say that V equals C, which is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So if we're talking about light in a vacuum or in air, we can replace V with this C. So basically the thing I want you to look at though is just the way that frequency and uh, wavelength are related. Because that means we can say C equals F lambda, therefore if I wanted to find F, I can say that F is just uh, C over lambda, or I can say that lambda is C over F. In other words, if I have frequency, I can find the wavelength, or if I have wavelength, I can find the frequency. So the frequency and wavelength are related to each other, but they're not exactly the same. In fact, they work opposite ways. So the greater the wavelength, the less the frequency, or the greater the frequency, the less the wavelength. So now let's apply this to what we call the electromagnetic spectrum. What this really means, spectrum means, you know, uh, well, in this case right here, we're going to talk about all the different types of light. So in this case right here, let's look at this nice diagram here, electromagnetic or EM spectrum. 
And look at this now. This is just sort of a, a, a way to describe it here. This is increasing wavelength to the right. So in this case right here, remember, that's wavelength. But in this way, going this way is increasing energy. In other words, that's frequency gets larger going that way. Wavelength gets larger that way. Now, how do we know it's energy? This is a quantum mechanics equation, but it basically says E equals HF. H is just a constant. So it basically tells you the larger the frequency, the larger the energy. So it tells you that things over on this end have large energy or small wavelength. Over here, large wavelength, small energy, and vice versa. So this is just one de uh, way to describe it here. What we can look at then is instead is the actual wavelength value. So we can have things in nanometers or nanometers or visible light, or we can have centimeters or meters or kilometers even. So we're going to be looking at and going through a quick tour of the different colors that exist. Now, when I say colors, that really is not a, a false statement. Okay, When I say colors, that's because it all depends on wavelength. So there exist so many different colors of light, and yet we can only see a tiny fraction of them with our own eyes. So of all these different wavelengths possible, so way over here at this extreme to way over here at this extreme, if we take this tiny, tiny, tiny little slice here, around a few hundred nanometers, if we take that and sort of zoom in, that's visible light. Visible, what I mean by that is by the human eye. So your eye can see this. So we can only see this visible light here. So these are the colors that we can see. So from 400 nanometers is sort of bluish purplish, all the way up to a bit past 700 nanometers, which is uh, reddish. And of course, then we can see all these different colors here. What I think is absolutely amazing is what one nanometer is. I mean, remember one nanometer is one times 10 to the minus nine meters. And that is tiny, 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 tiny. I mean, really, what this really is, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight zeros, and then a one here. That's how many meters this is. So that's very, very small. And the very fact that the human eye, I mean, if you see, if this color right here to your eyes looks different than over here, that means that your eyes are capable of distinguishing a difference in wavelength of only a few hundred nanometers. Your eye can actually tell the difference. So your eye, I think, is, is amazing. I mean, this is a miracle. The very fact that your eyes can tell the difference between 700 nanometer wavelength and 400 nanometer wavelength, I think this is really awesome. But our eyes have a limitation. If it's much lower than this, 400 nanometers then it sort of it becomes invisible to us and just like if it's a much higher than 700 you know, if it's way past that it is also invisible to us now does that mean that it doesn't exist well no it just means that our own eyes can't see it so us humans are fairly clever we've devised um, instruments that can see other colors so what kind of instruments do we have well we have lots of things so we're going to be talking about these differences here Okay, but this is basically, I think this is really, really pretty cool here. So now what we're going to do is do a little tour then. So we're going to keep going back to this picture here. And we're going to do a little tour of uh, some of the different colors that we can see. So let's start with infrared. Now the reason why it's called infrared is because it's redder than red. See, if you go more than red, see this looks red over here. More than red is called infrared. So now what can we do with infrared? Well, if you look at the sky, for example, this is one of the constellations. It's called Orion. In the visible light, the stars just look like these dots with a black background. But if you could use a telescope, for example, that's designed to see infrared, then it looks like this. Now you might wonder, well, why is it that I can see this as red? That's just because the telescope detects something. It looks like a black and white signal. And then we just show that on a screen that our puny little crappy human eyes can actually see. Remember, humans can only see between 400 and 700, roughly. A little bit further each way, but roughly this. So if we want to make a device that can see infrared or other things, we have to have a way to visualize it to our puny eyes here. So what we often do is we put it on a screen and the screen that emits it in some colors that we can see. But if you could see in infrared, this is what 
this same thing here would look like to you. Isn't this cool? Uh, so infrared can be used in a lot of cases. Uh, number one, it's used in, um, well, obviously to see stars, so in astronomy, but it's also used in a lot of things like night vision goggles and things like that because infrared is actually, uh, well, someone who's giving off heat. Turns off uh, heat from humans or even from, you know, car engines and things like that. It's actually emitting in the infrared which means if you make yourself a device, in this case, this right here is uh, using FLIR, it's called Forward Looking Infrared. So um, there's actually helicopters and airplanes that can see this, or you can have a handheld version for people to carry around. So Forward Looking Infrared. If you could do that, then take a look at this picture, and dark things, for example, are cold, and very bright things are hot. So for example, this is a human. This can help you to find someone walking around. You know, if it's perfectly pitch black outside, you could actually still see someone. So some people call this night vision goggles. Although there's lots of different versions and some of them merely increase the contrast. But I mean, uh, things that are hot actually emit light in the infrared. I've seen actually pictures from satellites where they can actually tell, for example, if a car has just been used or, you know, if a lot of heat coming from something. Because by taking a picture in infrared, something that glows in infrared means it's hot. So I think that's a really cool way to sort of, that's, that's a, a, cool, a few cool examples of infrared. So again, that just meant it was redder than red. Well, what if we go a little bit further on? Now we're going to talk about radio waves. So if we talk about radio waves, now we're, there's a big, big class of uh, things here. Well, radio waves comprise many, many different things. It all depends on what the wavelength is. But they're all in the category or the family of radio waves. Well, one of the things within radio waves is these big telescopes that we can use. I mean, this is actually called, uh, this is the Very Large Array. If you've ever seen the movie Contact, for example, with Jodie Foster, it's a good movie. Uh, the script and everything was written by Carl Sagan, a famous astronomer. But basically, um, what people can do is they can listen into the sky in radio frequencies. And there's a reason why that people are actually trying to listen in these frequencies. This is actually a fairly advanced graph here, but basically what this tells you is, this is sort of like the signal strength of what there is in the background, and this is sort of the frequency. In other words, this tells you the wavelength. And it turns out that the galaxy itself emits lots of junk. See, this is a very high signal here, so very lots of junk over here, lots less as you get to you know a larger uh, frequency or lower wavelength. But then, of course, there's other things, like our atmosphere, for example, has all these different um, things here. So, for example, the atmosphere might be doing some funny things, like it might be uh, absorb absorbing or emitting light in different colors here, or different uh, transitions possible. But there exists this sort of low area. This is like a window uh, where you, know, you can receive lots of signals from outer space. It will actually come in very well, because it's very low signal from the atmosphere and very low signal from the galaxy. Now, it turns out that these, these frequencies right here, Okay, between 0 and 10 gigahertz, uh, those actually tell you why it is that astronomers are listening to radio waves. Because I've had some students say, well, why are we trying to listen for aliens in radio waves? Well, this is one of the reasons, because there's this little window here. There's this little window, this sort of sweet spot between here and here of frequency, where we actually think that we could actually receive a lot of signals. And in fact, um, so the transitions for hydrogen and, uh, and other things, at least that are interesting, actually belong here as well. So there's a few reasons why you know, astronomers are trying to listen for these. Now, another type of radio wave is actually microwaves. So you might not think that, but actually microwave is just another color of light. Now, of course, what we use that for is for heating up food. And there's also something called the cosmic microwave background radiation. Turns out no matter where you point the telescope, you pick up a signal, depending, this is the wavelength and this is the strength of it. And basically it always goes like this. And what's really cool about this signal is it was exactly predicted uh, by the Big Bang theory. So not the show, I mean, but the actual sort of theory behind it. Said that, you know, if the universe had actually exploded or had some big uh, explosion at the beginning of it, then the explosion should have cooled to a certain temperature. And it was theorized by physicists that it should actually follow this exact shape. And what's really cool is you look out in the sky and you find this exact, exact shape. 
So this is why the cosmic microwave background is a really good example of theory matching uh, actual observation. And of course, another subset of uh, radio waves is radar. So this, for example, is an airplane. It's called the Hawkeye, for example. The American military uses these. It basically uses a radar to detect if there's planes coming. Well, you can also use what's called Doppler radar. And so that's, this, is a, this is a radar tower, for example, here. So it looks like a big ball. You can see these near big airports. If you see this, this has a little device inside that basically allows you to see things that are moving you know, towards you or away from you. And it turns out, for example, they use these to be able to tell things like a hurricane coming in, what kind of things and what kind of speeds are happening within that storm. A Doppler radar can see that, but also it can detect things like airplanes and even birds and stuff like that. And maybe a military plane wants to be hidden from radar, so they want to have a low cross section, which means, you know, the radar doesn't detect them. So there's all sorts of different things, but all of this is just a color of light. This is just a color of light here for radio waves. So we have radar, we even have your TV, well the old school ones at least before it was digital, and FM and AM, those are all just different colors of light. Although your eyes can't see them, they're actually there. So if we make a device like a television or like a radio that can pick these up, or we make something like a radar, or we make something like a microwave that actually emits these, then we can actually do some really neat things with these colors.